Hello, everybody. Welcome to day two of Roots. Woo. You guys are, are obviously all the early risers. That means you weren't partying hard enough last night, so tonight's your night, right? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, this morning, I'm very honored to uh, invite up Rob Joyce to speak for us. Uh, Rob and his son CJ were with us at the very first DEFCON, or Roots, which was called DEFCON Kids back then, talking about lights. And uh, Rob has had a really interesting career since then and before then. Hopefully he'll talk a little bit about that. And, um, and with that, I will invite Rob up. Thanks so much. Hey, good morning, everybody. So I'm Rob Joyce. I work at the National Security Agency, and I've been there about 30 years. So I came there straight uh, under uh, before college um, as an intern and got to dabble in engineering technology. And so NSA for me, it's been a really cool place because the kind of stuff you're experiencing at DEF CON, the, the love of technology, the understanding of what makes things work, trying to understand how to break it, how to make it better, um, those are the kind of things I've gotten to do throughout that, that, that 29 years. And uh, so recently, um, I was down at the White House. I was the uh, cybersecurity advisor at the White House talking about the policy for how we keep the nation secure as people try to hack our things. Before that, I was the chief of something called Tailored Access Operations. Does anybody know what TAO or Tailored Access Operations? I see a hand over at the soldering station. <laughs> Oh, I thought you were a kid. So young, like, is there a kid that knows what TAO is? So TAO are the hackers of NSA. They're the people who are trying to go into foreign computer systems and break in and get intelligence to bring that out um, so that we can understand what the threats to the country are, whether they're terrorism or other governments, uh, militaries, or the, uh, the, the activities that are going on um, to hack into our elections, our energy grid, and other pieces and things like that. So I've gotten to do cool stuff uh, along those lines. And NSA is interesting because you can be a hacker. You can go out there and break into computer systems. And our friends at the FBI won't come after you because you're doing it for your government. So that's a, that's a benefit in that space. So I'll talk about um, two different things here today. One set of stuff, I gave a keynote yesterday morning, that was this, which is cybersecurity. So I got to talk to the, the, the DEF CON adults about um, what are the challenges we're seeing against our country um, and what are the, the trends out in the, uh, out in the, the, um, the broad internet that uh, the changes that are affecting cyber. And then the second thing I'll talk about is a passion of mine, which is my home Christmas light display. And I'm talking about that at noon over in the DEF CON 101 track. So that's kind of cool. All right, so let me jump into some slides. And then I'm just going to save some questions in case you guys want to ask any questions. So one thing I've talked about over time is, as NSA, when we break into computers, what are the kind of things we have to do to break in? And so. It kind of goes through this path. The first thing we do is a big word called reconnaissance. That's understanding who we're going after. So it might be that you know the person you're trying to get after, but it might be you don't know. You just kind of, in general, we're trying to find out who are those Russians coming after the election system, right? So you've got to use all sorts of information out on the internet, through other intelligence means, um, sometimes through the signals we collect and you go out and try to understand who that is um, so that then you can start to work against their computer. So these are the same steps that if a bad guy hacker is coming after you or a business in the US or critical infrastructure, they go through. Then the next thing is they got to find a flaw. And you guys have been learning, I know, in the, in the election hacking village about some of the ways that computers aren't as secure as they need to be. So then it's figuring out what flaws are in those computers so that you can get in and you can do what you need to do. The next step is something called persistence. And that, that's because if NSA is interested in an intelligence target, they're not interested one time. It's usually a long-term threat, right? That, those hackers that are going after our elections, we had to worry about the elections 
um, that are coming up in November, but it's going to be the same worry in the presidential election and the next election after that and the next election. So we're going to want to find a way to get in that network and stay in that network. And then we have tools. Those are the things that we put down in the computer to make it do the things we want to do. So in cybersecurity, one of the things you've got to worry about is if you're trying to protect yourself and protect your computer, how do you go through these steps and break up their ability to get after you? In each and every one of these steps, there are things you can do to defend yourself. So just the same way as the attackers have steps that they're going after to try to get information. Um, and then a lot of the targets are not one computer, but networks of computers. And it may be you get on one computer and you can move around in the network to get to the information you need. And then at that point, it's looking at things that are going to be collected, um, things you've got to pull that data out. And at sometimes the hackers are coming in to make the machines do different things or even destroy them. And that's one of the trend lines we're seeing that, that has us worried. Um, so in, in cybersecurity, NSA has a second mission. Besides collecting information, we also have a set of activities that are aimed at protecting our national security systems, our critical infrastructure. And so that side of NSA um, does computer security and information assurance. So all the codes that protect nuclear weapons, NSA designs and secures the process by which we make the codes and then uh, people get to use um, and authenticate um, those nuclear weapons. So that's one of the most important things this country has is to be assured that when and if we had to use nuclear weapons that they're going to work, somebody can't stop you from using them. And two, even more importantly, that somebody who's not authorized can't in any way find a way to hack that system and, and, uh, and launch a missile or blow up a bomb. So that is a, is a really important mission that's entrusted with us. And so the expertise that goes in that, as well as the expertise we've learned by chasing other networks, comes together, and there's a series of advice. So these are some cybersecurity things that you ought to think about in protecting yourselves. So one thing, that first top, top lay, um, item, patch management. Everybody gets updates for your Windows, for your iPhone. It's really important when those updates come out to make sure your device is updated. Because at that point, somebody's found a vulnerability, and if you don't put that patch on, you're now, um, you're now vulnerable to be hacked. There's things like just plain knowing your network. If you grow up and you wind up working and managing a big network, um, what you'll find is the thing that the people who design the network think is on that network and what people have actually attached are two different things. And hackers find the things that are attached to your network, not the things you think are in your network. They're going to find those flaws and vulnerabilities. So it's really important to go through that. Um, and then these days, it's just really important to do backups. With um, ransomware and even some destructive malware, um, if, uh, if a virus gets on your computer, it can be gone. And all those photos you have, all those things you care about um, can be gone. So figuring out a way to do backups and manage those backups is important. So none of this stuff is sexy. It's not the things you think about in terms of, um, you know, NSA cool hacker stuff. But this is the basics, and these are the things that that make make it so that the hackers, whether they're criminals or nation states, are successful. So another thing we worry about is um, who's doing bad things on the internet. There's really four countries that are behaving in bad ways right now: Russia, China, North Korea. Um, and Iran. So Iran's been hacking Saudi Arabia and, uh, and, and, uh, and erasing computers in there. They've been, uh, they've been messing around with the oil production in Saudi Arabia because the two countries are fighting. We saw Russia hacking our election system. We've seen Russia trying to hack into our energy grid. Um, and we even saw Russia in a war with a country called Ukraine launch malware that they wanted to attack Ukraine with, but it wound up spreading around the globe. It hit people in the US, it hit people um, uh, across uh, Europe, and it wound up stopping ships, closing down ports and other things. So what we're seeing is a big, large uh, amount of, of consequences that weren't intended that come out of these um, hacks that hit other people. 
China's been stealing some of our technical secrets and then turning around commercially and producing things that undercut our businesses. And then North Korea, they hacked Sony Pictures when they didn't like a movie Sony was making. And they kept going, um, stealing, stealing currencies and stole $81 million. Here's a country on the internet stealing money from banks. Um, so they're behaving like thugs and criminals. So we've got to watch them and pay attention to them. So that was the, that was the short version of the, the, uh, the talk I gave yesterday on the big stage. The other one I'm set up to do at noon today over in the other, um, in the other uh, conference side is uh, building absurd Christmas light shows. Have any of you ever seen a computer controlled, really blinky, way, way wild Christmas light show? All right, let me show you what my house looks like. Yep. Oh, 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 Merry Christmas from our family to yours. So all of those lights are controlled by a Raspberry Pi. One Raspberry Pi. So it's subtle and understated. So, so these are all little LEDs. They're like the ones on your badge. So every LED can be red, green, blue, or a combination of those three. And when you mix those, those all make different colors. So every single light on that, on that, uh, on that house gets a computer command multiple times a second, many times a second, it's telling it whether to be off or on, what color and what intensity. And so I've cut and built all of the pieces that I hang on the house. And then there's a piece of software that lets me connect the music to the lights that are going on and off and tell it what I want to do. Now, some people think that the computer makes up the light blinks. It doesn't. It just plays the patterns that I tell it. So you've got to sit and kind of with a graphic interface, drag and drop the patterns you want onto those lights and, and make them work. So it's been pretty cool. Every year it gets a little bigger. So the, the tree in the one side to the right, you saw the pictures on. Those were like 15 feet tall and I can put pictures on it. You saw the animations and the graphics. Um, every year I add a little bit more and a little bit more over the garage where it says 2017. That's like a billboard you'd see outside a church or a business. And so I can run images and text and I can tell people to tune the radio and I actually broadcast a radio station to play the music. So people drive up and they can listen to the music on the radio station up there. So you guys can build this same stuff. It's Raspberry Pis, it's, um, it's soldering, it's a little bit of computer work. But the kind of skills you're doing here at, uh, at uh, Roots, um, you can absolutely do this stuff. So talk to mom and dad. You can have an absurd Christmas light show too. The other cool thing, the Charlie Brown sequence, I made that and then I put it out on the internet and people adapted it to their houses. So they won't have the same shape house. They won't have the same items on their lawn. But with the software, you can plug in and just drag and drop and it'll adapt it to your house. So... This was another one I downloaded off the internet. Somebody else worked on it, but I was able to put it on my house in about a half hour. Who knows what this might be? What do you think? Star Wars, yep.
All right, so, so the neighbors love it, my wife loves it. No, it's pretty cool. Um, but that is why I call it absurd Christmas light shows. It's really over the top, but it's a lot of fun. Um, and it teaches you a bunch of technical skills, right? You get to learn a little bit of networking, you're gonna do soldering. Um, you don't have to write any software if you don't want to, some people do, but there's, uh, there's open source software that just helps you through this. Um, it's a great way if you're into technology um, to, to play and tinker and, uh, and develop some skills. So with that, I'll take questions about Christmas lights or NSA or anything else in cyber you want to talk about. Anybody got a question? Yes. Can I what? So the question was, how can I be an operator? So at NSA, we've got people who are called operators. They're the hackers. Um, the best way to be an operator is to come to places like this Get some skills, get yourself a Raspberry Pi, learn how to, uh, how to run computers. Um, basically be into technology and be, uh, be interested in technology. And then you go, to computer, you go to school for computer science or you join the military um, to, do, uh, to, to do computer tracks. And so we recruit people out of both of those and they get to be hackers at NSA. So there's also, we have, uh, we have uh, programs for um, gifted and talented students between um, 11th and 12th grade. And we also have, um, we have co-ops and internships for kids who are in college. So as you get to be in college as a technical person, um, you can go to our website and find out uh, how to get onto, uh, onto the recruiting channel. All right, other questions? I'll be off to the side for a couple minutes while we pack up and out. Thanks for your attention. Thanks so much, Rob. It's really great to have you here. And kind of like yesterday, we had the CEO of a public company to have the U.S. Cyber Czar here speaking to you all, too, is I think just shows how important you all are and what you're doing here. So with that, you guys have seen these funky badges that you're wearing around your neck the whole uh, last couple days. But, oh, oh actually, sorry, we're running, we're running late. So, so Addy and Timken of Timkins, are you here? Oh, these guys first? Okay, never mind, never mind, come back up. Come back up. Okay, so before we talk about the badges, we have Sarah, Zyko, and Mudge up here to give a talk. And um, many of you will not probably remember this, but uh, Mudge was famous for saying he could bring down the internet within 30 minutes to Congress. And that was probably, what, 20 years ago? 20 years ago. Uh, so it's fantastic to have Mudge and Sarah here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, here's my mic. Got it. Can people hear me? Yeah, we're good? Okay, cool. So uh, we're gonna talk about a couple things today. First, I wanna make sure I can get the uh, um, uh, terms people need out of the way. So who here knows what a compiler is? All the, all the grown-ups. <laughs> can I see shows of hands from kids? Any of you know what a compiler is? Okay, we got a few. So, um, when somebody writes code these days, most of the time, they're writing it in a way that's easier for a person to read than a computer, right? The, you know, it, there's actual words and letters and things as opposed to it all just being ones and zeros. Um, but ones and zeros are what a computer reads. So before something you know, gets uh, um, executed by your computer, before the computer actually runs it, uh, the compiler is the translator it turns stuff from things a person can read to things a computer can read. And you know, not all translators are created equal. You know, the, um, 
when somebody translates something, there's usually a lot of ways that you can say that in another language. And uh, so these days, your translator on your computer is also sort of your spell check in a lot of ways. It adds a lot of safety features. It tries to fix things it can fix. And so it uh, tries to, you know, uh, add some safety features that the programmer might not even know about or fully understand. Okay, so we're good on compilers? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> How about functions? Do people know what functions are? Okay, I got a couple kid hands, yeah? All right. So when people wrote code back in the day, there were some functions that they used incorrectly a lot. Like, and they're the ones that an attacker would just look for and be like, oh, that's how I'm going to get in. No one ever uses that right. And so these days, the compiler knows that those are the ways people screw up and they try to fix it. Um, what you can think of it as is, uh, do any of you do like wood shop or metal shop in school? I know a lot of like middle schools and high schools have that. So, you know, when somebody's cutting something on like a circular saw, that can be pretty dangerous, right? You know, that's how uh, people lose fingers and stuff. But these days they have saws that can sense when, it, when a finger touches it and stop before you get more than a paper cut. <laughs> and if you're using the saw correctly, you'd never know which it was, right? Like, you know, the, it works the same either way if you're using it correctly. But if you screw up, you don't get hurt. So source fortification, yeah, uh, do you want, you know, so the, uh, hold on. Nah. So, you know, what this does is, I mean, we're not going to see somebody put a finger, but see, they put that hot dog there and it just, you know, the blade went away. That's what source fortification is. It has these functions where if you're using them correctly, you'd never know it got fortified. But if you stuck a finger in there by accident, <laughs> if you stuck a finger in there by accident, you know, you wouldn't get hurt. And so the compilers do that these days. If you tell it to, it'll replace all those historically really risky functions with the ones that are safer. Here's the catch, though. When somebody says, hey, I want to be safe. I want you to replace all my terrible functions I use with safer ones. It says, OK. And then it doesn't tell you whether it did it or not. Sometimes the compiler can figure out how to fix your stuff, and sometimes it can't. And the developer doesn't actually get any feedback. So you know they think, oh, I did a good job. I said, yes, do the safe thing. And the, uh, they never actually know whether the uh, final product is safe. And that's something that you'd only know if you actually went and checked, right? The, um, this is a problem that we've been noticing lately, is that people check the right box and they said, yes, do this safety feature. And then they assumed, oh, I'm so good, pat myself on the back, I fixed it. And, uh, you know, sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. So we're going to do a real quick how to read a chart. So this is a chart of how fortified different uh, uh, programs got, like how many of their fun risky functions got fixed. And it looks pretty good, right? Because if you look on the bottom, it goes from here. You can be my Vanna White. Can you point? So if it goes over here from where like almost nothing got fixed over to that end where almost everything got fixed, 95 to 100%. And that's the biggest bar, so that looks pretty good. But all those other little bars, those can add up. So how much of the total space do you think that big bar accounts for? Like how many of the functions is that? Yeah, so when you stack up those little bars, 
they're twice the size of that big bar. There's really only a third of them got mostly fortified, and then the rest have a whole bunch of unsafe functions still. But the developer has no idea whether they're in that big bar where everything got fixed or whether they're even down at like the zero percent, like nothing got fixed. The, they, because they don't get any feedback and they're not checking afterwards to see. And that's silly, because you know, if you were making that circular saw with like the, it won't cut your finger off kind of safety feature, the, you know, the manufacturer wouldn't just be like, oh, well, we designed it right, it's good. They test it, they give it the hot dog and make sure that it's not gonna hurt anyone. <laughs> but in uh, programming, people aren't really trained to think that way. They aren't trained to double check and verify that the safety features they turned on actually got done, which is really silly because programs these days are very complicated and funny things can happen. So two thirds, sorry. So two thirds of the time, it actually didn't make that loop or your program safe, and this is the difference between attacking and defending. And one of the reasons why attackers seem to have such an asymmetric advantage, because as Sarah was just saying, unless you actually measure it, you don't realize that the times it failed is twice as many times as the times it succeeded. And so that's what I work on: is trying to train people to measure rather than just assume. Uh, and working on coming up with ways to add like nutritional labels to software so that you can see what safety features actually got in there and which ones didn't, and which risky functions are still there and which ones aren't. So that, you know, when you're uh, trying to decide what browser to use, you can tell which one's junk food. Um, and so that's what I work on. Uh, because in general, that's something that our industry isn't super good at yet. And so that's something you might think about doing if you ever uh, <laughs> start doing this. So the general lesson here is turning the safety feature on, great. But remember to actually check it's there. <laughs> and uh, you know, this isn't just about source fortification. There's been stuff recently where they found out that some Windows programs thought that they had a bunch of really important safety features and they didn't. Um, you know, the, this is definitely not a problem that's only happening on Windows because every operating system is pretty complex these days. And it's just a problem we're only just now finding because people are only just now thinking, oh, maybe I should look and see whether it did what I thought it did. So you're familiar with airbags in cars, right? And seat belts. I mean, hopefully, and hopefully you're all using them. Um, imagine if your parents bought a car, and of course you expect it to have airbags and seatbelts. I mean, the seatbelts you can see, so you can kind of feel and, you know, you're interacting with it. But the airbag is just behind a little logo, right? Have you ever seen the airbag? Hopefully not. <laughs> really, hopefully not. But, you know, you're trusting that it's there. Um, you know your home router that you're connecting to the Wi-Fi? It theoretically has some airbags and seatbelts built into it and much like the airbags, you can't see them. It turns out that more than half of those home routers out there don't have the airbag even though it says it does. And so this will be the same thing as if you went to go buy cars and you expect safety features and they're advertised and the manufacturers you know, thought they turned it on but more than half the time it actually doesn't have it. So until you go measure it, until you start charting it and plotting it, which you know, you're the next generation going to do this, Go look at any of the other folks around here at DEF CON, if you see any of the talks online or whatever, you'll see there's not a lot of data. There's not a lot of measurement. It's a strange industry this way. You can actually own this industry if you start just measuring and notating and actually looking at it. That's, that's the scientific method, essentially. Um, and, you know, you will literally own it. Um, so don't let anybody, you know, intimidate you or anything else. Um, if you have data, you win. Everybody else just has an opinion. If they don't bring data, it's data versus an opinion. So, uh, how are we doing on time? 
Okay, so does anyone have questions? Yeah? Um, mandatory adoption, I don't know. That'll be a ways off and it would require cooperation from people who aren't super regulation friendly right now, so I think it might have to wait for some new guard to come in. <laughs> uh, but we're working on uh, putting up some reports on our site so that people can get data on the most common uh, things like browsers where it's really easy to change what you're using based on security feedback and uh, um, yeah you know it's an ongoing process <laughs> so for the kids here at roots like um, show a hand real quickly I'm gonna ask about your web browsers which ones are your favorite who here has their favorite browser is Firefox just raise your hand if you know what it is who here Chrome oh wow who here like Safari why do you like Chrome? That's an interesting question. We like Chrome also. But there's a lot of things that you'll use and that you like find as favorites. And you should actually, you know, go like, is it really better? Somebody might tell you it's better. It might feel like it's better. You know, that might be the common, you know, gestalt or like, you know, thought. But can you verify it? Can you actually measure it? And it turns out, yes, it turns out sometimes you can. And the answers are really surprising. But right now, Chrome actually is measurably stronger than the others, but nobody thought to measure it. Well, Microsoft Edge is pretty good, too. Yep. <laughs> they, they did really well. <laughs> oh. Yeah, so uh, we've been measuring browsers. We'll be putting some reports up soon. And yeah, um, for the most part, Chrome and Edge beat out all the others. It, they do better and worse in different environments, um, which is also sort of funny that you'd think if something's really secure on Windows, it would be secure on Linux too, but different people program them for different operating systems. Yes? How do you measure? Well, we do lots of different measurements. One thing we do is check to see what functions are being used to see if it's the one with the it won't cut off your finger version of a function or the older, bloodier version of the function. Um, another thing we do is to check whether those safety features are there. Um, and uh, when we can, we also do fuzzing, which, uh, do you know what fuzzing is? Show of hands, any kids know what fuzzing is? Yep, we got one over there. Right, so Fuzzing is that you just keep throwing garbage into a program and see how it breaks, how it crashes. Because how something breaks tells you a lot about how it's built. I'm going to show you how fuzzing works. I'm picking a number, I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 10. You have as many guesses as you want. What's your first guess? What's your second guess? What's your next guess? Yeah, you're fuzzing me. You're going to get it eventually. You threw in like all the possible numbers. Exactly, you went over 10. Now you're, now you're giving me weird stuff, and I might, you know, just blow up. <laughs> and if you guessed 11 and he was like, oh, cannot compute, that meant he didn't have very good error handling. <laughs> and so that's what fuzzing is. You, uh, it's expecting to get 1 through 10, and yeah, you try 11 or A or something like that and see whether it knows how to handle that. <laughs> Okay, so any more questions before we're done? Yeah? The question was, do we only measure browsers and stuff that people in the U use in the U.S., or do we measure, like, all software internationally? Is that close? So the um, measurement tools that we're making take uh, less than a second to produce the measurements for any particular binary, like, a, you know, any particular application. Um, so the, they're very quick. They can go through pretty much everything you throw at them. And 
the thing is that these days, pretty much everyone everywhere is expected to use the same software. Uh, the software tools that are put out there might get different language packages based on which country they're in. But uh, every, it's one size fits all when it comes to what people are expected to use. So we don't look at software as having a nationality, so we don't care. So it's all international, it's all the same to us. Any software, that's the whole goal, is every piece of software in this world should be able to be measured. Yeah, so right now anything that you run on a desktop computer or a laptop on Windows, Linux, or, uh, or OS X, we can do. Um, some of the things that are in your smart TV or your car might be stuff we can't handle yet, but we'll get there. <laughs> All right, so uh, is it time? Yep, okay. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah and Mudge. And I think it's interesting to note that both of these two worked at the NSA a long time ago and then went to go and start their own companies afterwards. All right, so next up. <laughs> uh, next up, we have Addie from Tinkers coming on up to talk about these wonderful badges that you guys have been wearing around your neck and hopefully giving you a few tips. Addie, welcome. Thank you so much. We're just going to do a quick setup and uh, then we'll get the presentation started. All right, well, hello everyone. Welcome to the DEF CON badge talk for Roots Asylum. Um, I'm Addie from the Toy Makers, uh, and that's spelled, if you take Toy Makers and you take out the vowels, that's how you spell our name. Um, and we're the creators of this year's badge. So, did any of you guys go to the opening ceremony by any chance? And that's okay if you didn't, that's actually kind of good. Because um, I was gonna say there's a little bit of overlap between what I told the, those at opening ceremony in a little bit here, but you guys actually get a few more hints than the adults do. Um, so we're the toy makers. Oops. We're the toy makers, and we are in Minnesota, and we run a hacker space in our basement because we didn't want it the we didn't want the spiders to take over, um, and so we decided to choose to let hackers into our basement. Uh, our team today um, consists of a hardware engineer, Wire, he's sitting down there. He's got uh, what we call beard magic. And so whenever he rubs his beard on electronics, they either work miraculously or they catch on fire. Um, and then we have our software ninja who is also sitting down there, but you can't see her because she's a ninja. Um, there's Whisker, uh, he worked on the game mechanics and uh, the design of how it would work, and I myself, uh, Addie, I'm a nurse by day, and um, I did the art and the uh, story for the badge that's probably driving everyone a little crazy right now. So I wanted to kind of break us apart just to say that some of us are really great at some things, and some of us aren't so good at other things. You wouldn't want me to design the electronics, and you definitely wouldn't want Wired to design the art, um, and you wouldn't want the ninja to design any hardware whatsoever. <laughs> so, and that's okay. Um, so, you know, you can always bring people together with different interests, with different skills, and then kind of build off of uh, the skills that each of us have. All right. So in case you're interested in designing your own badge, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about our badge design philosophy. Um, we like to think of badges on four levels. And you can take, if you're designing a badge, you can take as many as you want, you can take as few as you want. Um, but the first one is, ooh, shiny. I like what it, how it looks. Um, that to any general person, the badge looks interesting, looks different, looks unique. You know, maybe it's art that you've wanted to share with other folks, or maybe it's a character you like on a particular TV show. Um, the second level is about immediate interactivity. So uh, if you're looking at your badge, you might not know what it does, but you might also then realize that these pads down here cause the characters to move, right? 
So even if you don't know how electronics work, you can at least button mash, right? And get something happening. The third level is for those who uh, may not be experts but want to dig a little deeper. Maybe they're okay with plugging it into their computer. Maybe they're okay with taking a look at the story in the computer terminal and uh, playing the game, playing the computer version of the game. And then the fourth level would be for those who maybe are professional hackers, maybe are professional uh, you know, engineers or what have you, and we want to challenge them just a little bit more. Um, and these levels, you know, they could be fourth, fifth, sixth levels, they um, don't have to necessarily affect the rest of your badge, but they're kind of, it's kind of like putting Easter eggs for folks who want to try and dig deeper. And as you learn more in Roots Asylum and as you learn more in your electronics, uh, you may start saying, hey, I'm going to go back to that badge and I'm going to try and see if I can test what I learned. All right, so the theme of, the, of DEF CON this year is 1983, which I know many of you may not have been born uh, before. Um, and this is in relation to a book called 1984 by an author called George Orwell. And if you've never read the book, it's where concepts such as Big Brother, surveillance, paranoia um, comes from. And it describes a society that's essentially opposite of the hacker ethos, right? Um, it's not open, it's closed, it's controlled. And fortunately, you and I, we are time travelers today in DEF CON. Welcome to 1983, the year, woo! <laughs> the year before everything goes to apocalyptic doom. And uh, this is the year that we still have time to make decisions. This is the year where we can still make choices that change the future. Um, it's about what we choose to do, what we choose to accept, what we choose to um, ignore, even. So, uh, audience participation. How many of you guys have laptops? Raise your hand. All right. How many of you guys have webcam covers over the little camera? Okay. Food for thought. Why are we okay with putting webcam covers on the cameras instead of developing software or hardware that people can't hack so that we can freely let our webcams open? Why do we have to cover them? And so that might be something that we think, you know, have we just accepted that people are going to hack our, our webcam cameras? I think so, a little bit. All right. Oops. So, because these decisions are made by uh, everyday people like you and me, uh, our design aesthetic overall is everyday buildings for everyday people. And everyday people have, every, have different stories. We all have a different story coming into this. And so each type of badge, a human, goon, contest, CFP, et cetera, they all have an individual story. They have a different story um, depending on you know, who you are. And so depending on the badge, you might start out as an employee, you might start out as a visitor, you might start out as a student, et cetera. Now if you take a look at your badge, you'll notice that your DEF CON letters may be lit, red, green, a little yellow, which actually looks like a light green, or not at all. Um, these are reflective of the choices that you make in your story, that you make on your badge. And it, it's also the status of your puzzles. The letter N, and this is actually very, probably one of the more important parts, the letter N is what the sum of those choices are. They're you. They are, uh, they are your alignment, if any of you guys play Dungeons and Dragons, okay? Um, and red stands for contributing to the rise of apocalyptic doom. And green is contributing to a healthy, hacker-friendly future. So hopefully we all want to be green, but I know that we all started out as red here at the conference. 
just so we could provide a little challenge to, to everybody. All right, so you'll all also notice little people roaming around on your badges. So the green person is you. The red person is your little goon, because this year at DEF CON, we have decided to give everybody a little goon that they, they can carry around. Now, just as you can make choices in your own story, your, goon, your little goon will also make their own choices based on their alignment. So, if you want your little goon to make the same choices as you, then what you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna find a big goon who has a badge with an alignment that matches your alignment, and connecting your badge to that goon will allow your little goon in your game to take on the alignment of, your big, of the big goon. All right, so put simply, let's say you turn your N green, the first thing you're gonna wanna do is run and find a goon with a green N and hook onto them, because otherwise the little goon in your game could reset your game and erase all of the all the progress that you've made. Yes, and he's, he's a goon with a red N currently. <laughs> it's okay, we gotta, we gotta work on them though, right? Right. Now, <laughs> just as that goon's badge can affect your story based on the choices they've made, the choices you make can affect the, the badges that you connect to and vice versa. Because everybody's decisions affect everybody else. Okay, and that's kind of the point of the game that we've designed. So in order to get complete control of the lights on your badge, not only will your choices matter, but you are going to have to seek out others of every other badge type who, of who've made good choices, or you're gonna try to convince them to make the right choices, right? So I know a lot of people have been connecting badges you know, with speakers, with contest folks, et cetera, and maybe not paying attention to that N you're gonna to wanna to look at your end and their end. And you're gonna to wanna to make sure that if you wanna be green, that theirs is green. And so you may have to sit them down and teach them how to play the game so that they can get a green end, okay? All right, so a potential goal essentially is to get all of your DEF CON lights to be all the same color, either red or green. So some badge basics, um, if you guys look at your badge again, uh, we wanna make sure again that the badge was immediately interactive. So if you notice the bottom of your badge, uh, we've got the DEF CON symbol on the left and the 26 on the right. These are touch sensitive pads for up, down, left, right, and plus and minus. And these work for moving the character around uh, and changing the state of the puzzles that are in the game. Um, but sometimes capacitive touch doesn't work for everybody. And so uh, we've got a micro USB connector on the bottom of the badge. And this allows you to power the badge without batteries. And it also makes the game a lot easier. All right, so once you plug in the badge, uh, if you don't have drivers and it'll, I think there's a little pop-up that comes up, um, you may need to update the drivers and get microchips USB CVC drivers. This will assign what's called a COM port to your badge. So anytime you plug something in USB, it gets what it's called a COM port number. Open up a serial terminal emulator and be sure to put which COM port your badge is associated to. Um, and we recommend turning on IBM code page 437. It's just a little thing that changes the graphics a bit um, so that you're able to access an ANSI version of the badge. And ANSI is a standard that's used by artists um, in the text mode art scene, um, which was done back in the 80s. So kind of appropriate, I guess, for our theme. Um, and the terminal screen will show 80 columns wide by 25 rows tall, and it should match what's on your badge. Okay. So on the screen right now is a screenshot of the garage and the human badge. And you'll see that there's some story text on the bottom. Um, and on the bottom left-hand side, you'll see the controls that you can use to, which also show you which directions you're allowed to go. So green is good to go. Red, you can't go there, but you may if you solve the puzzle, right? And white is 
You, it's not even an option. Okay. On the bottom right, it'll show you what your DEF CON letter colors are. So it should that the ones on the right, bottom right, should match what's currently on your badge. So, puzzle hints. <laughs> These are ones that the adults do not know. <laughs> yeah. All right, so since these lights also reflect the status of your puzzles, this badge has both software and hardware puzzles. The main microcontroller on the badge is a PIC32MM, which is a microchip processor, and you can use MPLabX um, or a PICIT3 or 4 if you want to reprogram it. Um, and there's more than one microcontroller on this board. I know some folks have said, oh, I found the microcontroller, I found the LED driver. What are these other chips? There are more than one microcontroller on the board. All right. Uh, the code. So because we had to program 29,000 of these chips, all of the code for all of the badges is on that chip. So if you want, if you figure out how to access that other code, you can actually play the game for all eight badges. And you can see the graphics for all of them and the hints that we provide because every badge's story has different hints. All right. You can also pretend to be other kinds of badges. Um, and so the way we did this is we used three pins on each badge that are tied either to power or ground. And the badge looks at these pins to determine which badge it is, which badge personality it is. Okay, It's something called strapping or straps. All right, more puzzle hints. So each room in each badge, you know, you can go from the, uh, the top, area, to the ramen shop, to the garage, to the arcade room, and the human badge. Each room in each badge is associated to a different badge type. So if you connect with the contest badge, red versus green, it'll change in, that, in one specific room what you get versus what you don't get. Okay. Connecting with someone with a green N versus a red N will change what you get in the story. I wasn't going to say this, I know, I know, but my recommendation is just to find those with green ends of every badge type and hook up, okay? Now, um, if you stay in the same room as a goon that has an opposite uh, personality as you, right, then they may reset your game if you stay for more than one second. We've given you guys a little leeway so you can quickly escape from the goon. Okay. And different badge stories, again, share different hints. So if you can find the, I think someone's already gotten all the software, but if you can read through all those hints, then that actually might give you a fuller picture. All right, so I think I'm running out of time, potentially, but I just wanted to really quickly show you guys the pictures of the other different badges just in case you haven't had a chance to see them. And um, on the left hand side is what we have and on the right hand side is what I drew just sitting there in front of my computer thinking of strange things. Um, so the human badge, it was based on a garage um, but we have a few cool things. So one a ramen shop because I really like ramen. Um, we've got garage, we've got a nod to Back to the Future. So has anyone seen Back to the Future? Yeah, you know Doc Brown's a uh, huge speaker in his couch? It's right there in the middle <laughs> with the DeLorean on the side of it. <laughs> um, we've got a nod to Metropolis, which is a great like 1920s movie about robots and dystopia. And then we've also got a subway train on the bottom right there. The press badge is a broadcast station and it's got everything from a big satellite dish to the newsroom, to printing press for newspapers, all the way down to a photography room there on the bottom right. 
We've got the Goon Badge, which is based on a panopticon, which is actually a kind of an interesting prison where the guard tower is in the middle and all the rooms are around the outside like a cylinder. Um, and so we gave them some cyberpunky elements and uh, they've got a few interrogation rooms in their badge as well. Uh, we've got the contest badge, which is, which is based on a library. This is actually one of my favorites because I, I love libraries. Who doesn't? Um, and so there's a lot of books, a lot of lounges, a lot of ladders to get to those books. We've got a vendor badge, which is based on a factory. Uh, my favorite part about this is that there's a crane in the basement. And uh, I decided if I could put a crane in the basement, I would. That's why there's a crane in the basement. All right, the speaker badge, this is really cool. It's got different types of theaters. It's got drive-in movie theaters, the normal theaters. Uh, it's got like a big performance hall theater, and it's even got a rock concert hall on the bottom. The artist badge is based on a gallery. And so I put in some artwork. I put in another performance hall because artists, of course, musicians, of course, are artists as well. Um, and then in the basement, artists and museum curators, they always have to deal with shipments coming in and random mummies showing up. And so I decided to add a mummy in the basement. And then CFP, which is call for papers. They're the folks that choose uh, what talks are being given here at DEF CON. And so I thought a school would be appropriate. And the architecture at the top there, that's based on MIT, uh, some of the buildings at MIT. And um, in the basement, we've got underground server rooms. We've got a sewer system. And apparently, there are some colleges that have mines in their school. And I, so I said, well, I have to include a mine in my school. So I included a mine. I added a stegosaurus fossil. And that's call for papers. And that is it. Do we have time for questions? Or? Any burning questions? One question? OK. Who wears the artist badge? Sorry, I'll get to it. Who wears the artist badge? Uh, musicians, um, anyone I think who's done graphics. I know on Twitter some of the artists have been saying, oh, hey, I have an artist badge. You know, come and find me here. Um, so that's, yep. What if you can't find the green With the green end. What if you can't find anyone with the green end? That's a great question. So, ready? You hack their brain, right? What we can do as, ha as hackers, as fellow hackers, as people of this society, is to change someone's mind and say, hey, I know you don't want to be part of the apocalypse. I know you don't want zombies to get us. Why don't I help you with your story so that we can benefit each other? Thank you. The amount of work that goes into these badges is just incredible. So let's give Addy another round of applause. <laughs> Thank you, John. All right, so next up is Gadget Girl. Gadget Girl is one of our star kids here because she started off just coming, and now she's uh, running her own workstation over here, which is something that all of you can do eventually, too. So if you have an idea for a workstation, come and tell us. We'd love for it to have you do something here, too. Uh, uh, Gadget Girl, come on up, and she's going to talk about how you, too, can use your skills. Hey, guys. I'm Gadget Girl, and I'm going to talk to you guys about using your hacking skills. So now that you guys are here at DEF CON, at Roots Asylum, what do you do now? Where do you implement these skills in your real life? So when you say the phrase, I'm a hacker, to anyone probably outside of this room or outside of the conference of DEF CON in total, they'll probably think of this. This is what pops in their head. 
this image of a black hoodie, a guy in a black hoodie who's doing something evil per se, and that's what they imagine. But you guys, when you say, what's a hacker, or I'm a hacker, you think about the people that are sitting right next to you. You think about the people who are up here giving speeches. You think of the people helping you at the workstations. You know those are hackers. So, and you guys want to educate the public on what they are. That's why you guys are here. So when I tried to look up these images, I couldn't look up hacker because I got the images that I had up before. What I had to look up was programmer, person soldering, person designing, person using CAD. You had to look up these kind of things to get what a hacker is. So what does a hacker, what is a hacker made up of? Well, I define a hacker or what they're made up of is they're an engineer, they're an artist, and they're a leader. Because they're an engineer because they're problem solving, they're building things, they're taking things apart. If you guys have been to Junkyard, you guys were taking stuff apart yesterday, rebuilding it. If you guys were soldering, you guys were creating things, that's an artist. If you've been over to my 3D printing station, you've been creating different designs and printing them. So that's an artist. Then there's a leader. Well, almost all of you guys should be leaders because you guys are here. You guys are standing somewhere that most people wouldn't dare to say that I'm a hacker outside of this room. Because you guys are telling something that has a social People socially assume that hackers are bad people, and you guys have to tell them different. That's why you guys are leaders, because you're stepping up to the plate and saying, no, that's not how it is. This is my definition, and this is the way that they actually are. I am one of them. Let me explain it to you. That's a leader. That's what a hacker is. A hacker is an engineer, an artist, and a leader. So you have to share what you've learned in this entire conference. You need to go back, whether it's just to a friend, whether it's to your teachers, whether it's in a classroom, when they ask one interesting thing about you, you say, well, I'm a hacker, and then explain what it is, because otherwise they're gonna be terrified with you. Am I right? So this is one quote I really like, is that you cannot uneducate the person who has learned to read. So once you tell them what hacking really is, you can't take that away from them. So never be afraid to tell people about it. So one main characteristic is social engineering. This is something you guys have to have. It's a portion of being a leader. You have to communicate. You have to tell them about hacking. You have to create a network. What about the people that you guys have talked to at these workstations? What about the person sitting next to you? Did you help them, give them a helping hand? Maybe you met someone cool at this conference, made a new friend. Well, now you have a network. Now you know other people who know how to hack. So now you can introduce them to new things. You can share it. You can share it with the people back home who have no idea what hacking's about. So how does this apply in your day-to-day -day lives? Because you can't find most things with the label hacking on it besides this conference and a couple others, especially for kids. So go to something like STEAM, or maybe you've heard of it as STEM. It's science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. Maybe your school has a STEAM or STEM program. Maybe the local library has um, a technology center. Go try out these different things and they have things that are similar to hacking and fit in the category of hacking, but they are not labeled as hacking. So where do you actually apply these skills? You can apply them in the school, like I said. You can apply them at libraries, in public places, but really the answer is everywhere. You want to apply your hacking skills that you've learned here today at Roots and this week to school, home, community, extracurriculars, and especially here. I mean, you gotta use it here. So these are some of the things that I personally got involved in, and they're also examples for you guys to look at. So I'm 17, I'm gonna be a senior in high school, or I am a senior in high school, and so I've done a lot of this stuff throughout high school, and there isn't many options. For one, leadership is a huge part of hacking, I believe. A lot of people don't register it, but you guys are confronting the problem confronting what social justices are surrounding hacking. So that's why leadership institutes and different leadership activities are perfect for you guys. See if there's a leadership crew at your school where you can get involved, take a leadership position, introduce new technology at your school. Or maybe you do a camp that's all about leadership. You just grow your skills, grow your networking, grow your communications. Or maybe you attend an honors institute. 
Honors institutes are for the kids that love to problem solve. That's more the engineering side. So now you have the engineering skills, the leadership skills, and the art skills. So put them all together and then educate other people with them. So different camps, especially through universities, are a great way to get involved. Oftentimes they're free. I know a lot of you guys aren't in high school yet, but maybe the, I'm talking more to the middle and high school students that there are camps for free available at your local colleges. So look them up, whatever state you live in. I live in Arizona, so I'm, most of these are Arizona State things that I've done. But you guys can look into all your local universities and go through this stuff and see what leadership opportunities are available for you and see what engineering opportunities are available for you and what artistic opportunities. Another thing is public speaking. So I'm standing up here today. I saw a lot of kids up here uh, yesterday and this morning. So you guys, you need to be up here. If you want to lead, if you want to educate the public, you need to tell them about it. So, I mean, everyone's terrified of public speaking. I mean, like, I'm shaking right now, but it's okay because... I'm getting myself out there. I'm challenging myself. That's the way I do it. So you guys need to challenge yourself. You need to come up here and do this. You guys need to start running a workshop. Like people have mentioned to you, guys, find more ways to get involved. Don't just do your activities and then leave. You, I mean, you can do that. You're educating yourself, but now go educate other people. Confront the issues. So then one final thing is um, look at public places. A lot of communities will have 3D printers. So we have 3D printers down here. Maybe you already have one at your house, and that's fantastic. But maybe there's one at your public library, at your school. So just look into it more. There, there's tons available nowadays. So I'm going to go quick onto a different track. Look at these percentages here. As you notice, they're all pretty low. The first one, these, this data is um, from MBC, MIT, and LinkedIn, respectively. So the first one, 2%. That's 2% people who identify as female who are hackers. Yes, that's a real number. 13%, that's a statistic from MIT of women in the engineering workforce. 25%, that's from LinkedIn, and that's a little bit higher. That's women in leadership positions. So look at those numbers. These are all hacking, all of these. So we need more women in the field, and the public seems to think so too. So there are quite many opportunities for girls. So if you are, if you do identify as a female in the room, um, some different stuff is that there's the National Center for Women and in Information Technology. And they offer scholarships and different things like that. I've been lucky enough to receive some. And then we also have Girl Scouts. Girl Scouts has a big driving force for girls in technology. And then there's also some organizations like Girls Who Code. And there are millions others beyond this. I'm just basing out some of the three that I've gotten involved in throughout my years. But, so enough about the girls, because I know majority of you guys are males, but I just wanted to point that out. So there's a lot of other opportunities besides just for females, especially for minorities. So besides females, you have people that are African American, you have people who are Hispanic, you have people who are in the LGBTQ plus community, or girls. So all those minorities have huge scholarships for engineering and technology, so just look for them. If any of you guys identify as any of those things, just look for them. They're, it's free money. I mean, come on. You guys should all luckily want to go to college or want to get a job after this, hopefully. I'm hoping that. So you guys look for the money. It's there. Just, it's literally there. Anyone who wants to go into this field, look for it. Um, even if you're not doing that kind of stuff, there's different ways to get involved, like First Lego League, Vex Robotics, um, there's different engineering programs that colleges actually offer. So if you go to your local college, if you go to your like, local high school, they have engineering STEM pathways. They have days for engineering, just fun activities. Maybe you're like, well, I already know how to do that. I came to DEF CON. I'm a master at soldering. Maybe it's something new, or it's establishing your network. You meet new people. You get to do new things. It's up to you guys, but getting involved is the number one way to become a leader and educate more people on hacking. So thank you guys. Um, I wanted to wrap it up with one final note and then I'll ask for questions. So these are the... Uh, chola trees, jumping chola trees. So the way these um, work is pretty much they're trees. Any of you guys from Arizona or Nevada or even California? Anyone? Yay, some locals, okay. So you guys may have seen these. It's a type of cactus essentially. Um, when an animal passes by, it shoots the jumping chola onto it, and it's this little 
a ball with like spikes on it and essentially animals carry it to new locations and then a new tree grows. So that's what I want you guys to know. Say you're a hacker, become the tree, and when anyone walks by and asks a question, just shoot what a hacker is at them. Go for it. Tell them all about it. So that's it. Thank you. Do you guys have any questions? There are some ways that you can unlearn things, but the great majority of the population, if you tell them what a real hacker is, they're not going to forget you. They're not going to forget what you told them, or they're not going to forget you. So that's a good way to keep someone remembering of you. When you tell them you're a hacker, from now on, you'll be remembered as the kid who's a hacker. Maybe good, maybe bad, but make sure you tell them so that eventually it gets in their head that it's good. Gadget girl, you rock. Thank you, really appreciate it. Next up is Aaron Owens to talk about drone wars. And what, one of the cool things about drone wars is this is a, a workshop in a village that started at Roots and has now moved out to the adults at DEF CON because they wanted this too. They weren't the only ones that were allowed to have fun. So with that, Aaron, come up on stage. I'm not Aaron, and I don't see Aaron. I think Aaron was up all night long soldering things, and he might be downstairs. We'll try to find him, but maybe we can go on to the next one, Rita. Okay, uh, Pony Boy, right? Pony Boy, are you here? All right, thanks for being flexible. He's a pro speaker. He's spoken to you guys before, you might remember. So everybody welcome Pony Boy. Hi. Oh, oh. <laughs> Hi. Um. Okay. Today I'll be talking. I'm Emmett Brewer, and today I'll be talking about how to hack web apps by leveraging a tool called Burr Suite. So with that being said, let's get started. Who am I? Well, I'm Emmett Brewer, also known as Pony Boy. I'm 11 years old. I enjoy messing with computers, and I've been going to DEF CON and Root since 2014. I enjoy everything security-related, and in this photo, um, And horseback riding is another hobby I like to do in my free time. So, before I even start discussing vulnerabilities, let's look back at a certain section of the Roots Honor Code. Only hack things you own, only do good, and know the law, the possible risk, and the consequences for breaking it. And so you do this to um, end up not in jail. So, here are some common web vulnerabilities. You have data validation, like the ones we used over at election hacking. This is cross-site scripting and SQL injection, session management, cross-site request forgery, and cookie security issues, a more common configuration issues, insecure HTTP methods like put and delete, accessible old or backup files. We'll talk about this one later. Business logic attacks like replay attacks or malicious file uploads, authentication, guestable usernames and passwords, authorization, authorization bypassing, and direct page access. And the ones highlighted up in red are the ones I'll be mostly talking about today. So with that being said, let's get into the demo. So I'm using Burp Suite, and I don't know if you can see it that well. OK. It's a proxy, and it's going to run on localhost 8080. So I better set my browser 
and here let me make it larger and set my browser settings over to that. So general network proxy, manual proxy, and set it to localhost 8080. So now when we go to google.com, for example, when we go to burp and HTTP history, we can see all of the requests being sent back and forth from our computer to Google and vice versa. So I have actually have access to a web application which my friend gave me. It was an old capture the flag program. So before I even like to discuss vulnerabilities, however, I like to take a look around the website. So it seems that these are just a couple of products, not much here. Under the about page, there is not much else, just their locations of their offices. A contact page, I don't know, enter something random. Send message. Staff will contact you in 720 hours. Well, that doesn't seem very friendly, however. Maybe under customers? Seems like we could take it for a test run. And it looks like we have access to a guest account right now. So let's go enter guest. In. So now we're in the guest account. What now? Um, there's a script repository, which it seems like we don't have access to right now. And what's this? Change password. Enter something completely random. And this also doesn't seem to work. Well, that doesn't seem like much we can do right this second. But I want to take a look back at the products page. It seems sort of interesting. So I'm going to click through all three of these products and go back over to Burt and look at the requests. So there are three requests being sent, and they all seem to end in maybe a base64 encoded string. How about we go to an yet another cool feature of Burp called decoder? We're going to decode this base64 string. Decoder, enter this, and decode as base64. And it seems like it's now a number. So why don't in here we saw that there are three different values. X, they end in X, Y, and Z. So let's try and replicate this in decoder. X is one, ends in one, Y ends in two, and Z ends in three. But how about we try re-encoding it as, let's maybe change it to four. Re-encode it as base64, and let's see if maybe we can access this in our browser. So let's go back over here, change the URL, and and it seems that we now have access to a hidden product. This is a direct page access vulnerability and is pretty common in most websites. So besides this, I'm going to go back to the customers page. I think it might also hold value. Let's log in back as guest and maybe go back to the change password function. Enter something random again and it won't work, but why don't we look at this request in Burp Suite? Go under back under proxy, and let's take a look at this post request a little bit better. So um, we can see that the parameters being sent are the password parameter, the confirmed password parameter, and the is guest parameter. And out of those three values, I think the is guest parameter is the most interesting. Burp has uh, a cool feature besides those two we discussed called repeater. It allows you to repeat requests. So why don't we send that over to repeater and take a better look. So like I said, we have those three parameters. How about we try changing the is guest to zero? Maybe this will allow us to escalate our privileges. Hit go and I guess it worked. The password has been changed. So why don't we go back to our website close out of here, log in as guest, and with our new password, log back in. And it seems like we're able to escalate our privileges to allow us to change our password. Pretty cool. Now, I think that does it for those um, links up here in the navigation bar, but another, direct, another file I like to look at is robots.txt. It's normally located in the website root um, and is used to deter away bots from certain directories. So let's go there. 
it doesn't seem like much except for this one directory right here. Why don't we try going there? And maybe something will happen? It seems they have just so conveniently turned on directory indexing, allowing us to see every file in the directory. So let's take a look at this text file. It's saying here that he's created a new customer account called support test and he's able to allow people to send a link directly to him if there's a problem with the site. So why don't we take a look back at the contact form to see if there's anything we might take a look at. Contact form, what can we help you with? And problem with website. Enter something random, random, I don't know, google.com and random message. Why don't we just try sending this to see what happens. That does not look like a URL to the site and we get an error back. Why don't we just try entering this URL to go to here. Doesn't seem very useful however. Success, I'm looking to that link now. So he's, eventually he's going to click on this link and he's going to see it. Right now this doesn't seem very useful but maybe we can pair this with the forgot password function to allow us to execute a cross-site request forgery attack on his account. So let's go back to Burp Suite, go back to Repeater, and since it will be hard for the user or admin to click on a post request, let's convert it to a get request simply by right-clicking and changing the request method. And we can also just send it again to make sure it works so we didn't mess anything up. Hit go, and it seems like it still works. Why don't we try right clicking and copying the URL, going back to Firefox and pasting the link here. We probably don't want to change the guest account again, so let's try and change the password of the support test account mentioned earlier. So, let's just send it again, and he's looking into that link now. Why don't we try logging in as that now? and entering our new password. If we actually clicked on the link, it would have executed a cross-site request forgery slash account hijacking request, allowing us to change the password and gaining access. So when we log in, and it seems like he actually did that. So now we have access to a admin account. We can do whatever this is and now access it, and we can also change the password now. So that does it for the vulnerabilities I'm gonna show you but here's some further reading. You can check out OWASP for their top 10 project, which documents the most common web vulnerabilities every year. The Zap Web Proxy, an alternative to Burp, which I use this year. WebGoat, a deliberately insecure web application used for teaching kids or anyone about web vulnerabilities. You can also check out Burp Suite and the Roots Honor Code. I really suggest you look at the Roots Honor Code. So with that being said, are there any questions? All right, thank you. Thanks so much, Pony Pony Boy. Another great talk. I always learn something from you. <laughs> All right, so next up is Aaron. Aaron, we've already introduced you. All the kids are, are anxiously awaiting, but we were so proud that your Roots Village for Drone Wars has now made it to the adults as well. So uh, very excited to have you here. So give Aaron a couple minutes to set up, and, um, and then we'll get going. And we have two more talks, and then all the workstations will start. Anyone have any, any questions or comments? Anything they want to say on the mic while we're letting Aaron get set up here? What about you? Do you have something to say? <laughs> Anyone want the mic? Here's your chance. Pamela. <laughs> hey, 
Hey guys, if you want to continue uh, coding with the badges, uh, the Roots badges, um, all of the code uh, that you worked on and tons of tutorials and links are on GitHub at Hello Techie. So if you go to Hello Techie, you will be able to get all of that and know how to set it up on your own computer. Um, it includes links on how to use a mobile app to control your device. It also talks about IoT and also um, some Wi-Fi hacking. So I really recommend going there. We're also running a contest uh, for next year's badges. So if you have an idea or a theme, uh, we have two, yes. <laughs> so you guys can choose. We have two prizes um, to give out, one for best idea for a design um, and theme of the badge, and the next one is what the badge does. So if you want the badges to hack each other or you want the badge uh, to play a game or anything like that, uh, so just write out your ideas. Um, I will be taking down ideas over there, and also something special is that whoever the winners are next year, the badges will have uh, your hacker name on the badges itself. Uh, so a really fun thing for you guys. Thank you. Okay, Hacker Jeopardy update. We've got Hacker Jeopardy. How many people have done Hacker Jeopardy? Okay, we're, we're playing tomorrow afternoon, 1 o'clock. And if you guys have never seen or played Hacker Jeopardy before, it's one of the funnest events, so definitely try to stick around for it tomorrow. Yeah, we've got some, got some great prizes as well. And uh, so we have a group for 12 and over and one for uh, under 12. And so I've got uh, one full team, Alex Trebek's children. Um, we, have a, we have another couple teams, but they have some spaces. So if you're 12 and over, um, check this out, get a friend, sign up. We've got lots of room for the 12, for the uh, under 12 group. So if you're under 12, come on kids, get a team, it's going to be fun. We'd like to have at least three teams, um, three or four people on a team, okay? So these are, these are back at registration. Consider being uh, on a team playing Hacker Jeopardy tomorrow and winning prizes. It's lots of fun, free crickets. Thanks, John. All right, so we're going to switch the order again. We still only have two talks left, but first we're going to bring up Riverside to talk about the Wall of Sheep. Now, Riverside and his team are also the ones that built all the replicas of the Secretary of State websites for us. It was just tremendous amount of work and, and lack of sleep that they put in to do that for us. So let's give them all a big round of applause. And if you haven't checked out the Wall of Sheep Capture the Flag Village that Riverside and his team run, I do suggest seeing that after this. You can venture out of here and uh, go see more about what they're doing. All right? Thank you. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, to, the, to the 26th DEF CON for some of our kids in this world. Uh, it's... How many DEF CONs have you been going to now? 13, 13 DEF CONs. So this gentleman here, FS, is uh, one of the kids that came to DEF CON before there was a Roots. He said, hey, Dad, I really want to go to DEF CON. And his dad, who's in the back, is, what the heck is DEF CON? I, I, don't, I don't know what that is. He's like, but I want to support you in what you believe in and, and help you grow. And so there's this father and the son wandering around what the, you know, the not so kind version of DEF CON was at the time. And he's protecting them from all the stuff. And he comes over to the wall of sheep and, and our team is like, what are you doing? What is this? And he sits down and we start teaching him things and, and that he's been with us ever since. And uh, this guy over here is, is my other boy. Um, and he's, he's now working out in our village and, and doing all sorts of stuff. So there's a, a place for kids throughout the conference. As they grow into things, you go into the villages, you meet people, you can participate and help run events throughout this whole conference. So what is the Wall of Sheep? Um, Wall of Sheep is something that I created 18 years ago or so. Um, and uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. So how many of you have ever sat in a classroom and had a conversation with somebody and somebody in the class overheard something 
that you didn't want them to hear? By raise of hand. Yeah? So, you, so you're telling a secret and somebody overhears it and that's not a good thing. You don't want them to hear your secrets, right? So sometimes you'll say stuff in silly talk or in, in uh, you know, some other language. You try to do um, pig Latin or something to kind of make it a little bit more secret. Well, if you're having a conversation in your classroom, there's nothing that you can do to prevent anyone from overhearing you other than whispering really, really quietly inside of their ear with some private secret language. Well, that's kind of what we do on the network here at DEF CON. All of the traffic and everything that everyone says on your computer across to the internet is just a conversation. And we're listening all the time in our village back there. And so if you say something like your computer says, hey, can I have some email? Can I go look at an image? We're watching that and we see what you're doing and we we'll read your email potentially if you're not using some way of encoding it or encrypting it or protecting yourself. And so out in the wall, what we've done is the people that don't use security, we take the information, the username and their password for their email or their whatever account it might be, and we put a part of that up on the wall for all the people to see to, one, let them realize that they need to do something better about security so they see, oh my gosh, I'm up there, what do I do to get off, get off the wall? And they come up to us and say, well, clearly my, my security practices aren't really good, what can I do? Can you help me? And so we sit them down and we teach them. And since then, uh, we've started creating a lot of different games, Packet Detective and Packet Inspector, for people that have no knowledge and want to learn this, this tradecraft, which is called Packet Analysis or Threat Hunting, and we have three separate sections in our village where you can sit down on laptops and play. And it, I actually see some people inside of this room that play Capture the Packet and Packet Detective and brought their kids over. We have a lot of things. Our, our village is, is relatively kid-friendly. Um, we have lots of kids running around our area because we brought, we've all brought our children to, to the conference. And um, we, we would love to have you come over. Do you have any, any questions out there? No? No? So I, we brought a couple goodies to, to throw out to the crowd. You guys want to start? You don't want to peg anyone with a, a shirt? Uh-oh. So these were the smallest ones that we could find. And I will, who wants a shirt? as well. Thank you all very much. Thanks so much again, Riverside and team. And you know, one of my favorite things about DEF CON, and maybe you have noticed, is DEF CON is run on the gift economy, if you will. So the people that raise, are, are risen to the highest in this community are the ones that give back the most, right? It's not about paying the most, but it's about what you give back to the community. And Riverside is a perfect example of someone that has just given and given back to the community for years. And that's why he's such a rock star. So it's something you all can do too. And with that, one last time, Aaron Owens with Drone Wars. Hey everyone, glad to be back at Roots this year. How many of you came through the Drone Wars program last year? How many of you came to Drone Wars last year? All right, I see a lot of hands. Okay, we've been coming to Roots now for five years. Uh, we started with robotics about three years ago and have evolved into doing drones. We are now, as Nico mentioned, uh, I believe the first workstation from, uh, from, uh, from Roots here to actually evolve into a full village here at DEF CON. So I don't know if you've had a chance yet, but I've seen a lot of kids come through uh, I think you came down as fans from last year, and we really, really appreciate that. Uh, but thank you for coming and visiting. 
uh, but we're downstairs and we're hacking drones like crazy. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're doing down there too, but I'm, I want to really focus on what we're going to be doing in here for about three to four hours today, and we hope you have a chance to come through and see us. But before I do that, I'm going to introduce you to a few people on my team. So again, my name is Aaron Patrick Owens. I go by Dark Skies. Uh, we've been flying drones for quite a while and now hacking drones, and we have a really exciting community uh, that I'll introduce you to over the, over, the course of the, uh, over the course of our workstation. But with that, I want to introduce a couple of our youth members. Uh, the first one here is Stealth Rock. Come on up here, Stealth Rock. Hi there, I'm Stealth Rock, and uh, I will be running a um, drone flight area. And um, it's going to be really cool. We're going to be flying some virtual drones, and um, hope you guys come and check it out. Thanks, Stealth Rock. I want to introduce you one of uh, one of Drone Wars, or and not just Drone Wars, but one of Roots' uh, uh, also longtime participants. I want to introduce you also to Firestarter, who's helping out today. Hi everyone, I'm Firestarter. Well, I go by Firestarter at least. Um, I'm here to help build and fly drones here at Roots today, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Okay, I'm having a little trouble with the projector, so we're going to skip that. But hey, guys, I just wanted to show you real quick, uh, talk to you about what we're going to be doing. If you could go ahead and do just a quick flight demonstration. We have two things happening here at Roots today. Right here in the center, we're going to be building drones again. Those of you who built drones last year know that we built the mini TIE flight fighter drones. We've 3D printed those in advance and then brought them out here to Roots so that we could build and play with those, and everyone got a chance to fly. Do you guys remember some of the issues with the flights last year? The little TIE fighters were flying over and oops, someone hit a ceiling. Yep, you were one of them. <laughs> I remember that. So hey, we had a few novice pilots, right? So we decided, hey, instead of getting a TIE fighter in your face during the course of being here at Roots, we created this year a hover drone. Now the hover drone is something we 3D printed and we can actually fly that and the kids are gonna be flying that up here on, on the stage. So we, uh, we're going to build those from scratch. You'll have your 3D pl printed platform, and then you'll be able to build that from the parts we donated from one of these donors. So this is our don donor drone. It's an FPV, first person view drone, that you can see where the drone is actually going. Now the way I'm going to see it, if you watch it fly, it can move back and forth, left and right. It goes up and down. We're going to teach you a little bit about the telemetry of flying a drone while you're over at our workstation. And you can see we have a lot of fans here that just love a drone in flight. Doesn't everybody like something in flight? All right, let's hear it. <laughs> I think we have our first Drone Wars participant going. So for her action, she's going to get an official Drone Wars mission patch. Come on up. All right. Okay, guys. How many of you have been watching drone racing on television? Anybody? Oh, I see a lot of hands over here. Okay. Yep. Oh, the youth love drone racing. Look at that. Drone Racing League is one of our sponsors. They've actually provided us a lot of stuff this year to make this fun and make this happen. MultiGP is another one of our sponsors, and they're a racing league also. They're the largest international race league. They're hosting the largest international race in history today, and that's happening in Indiana. So since they're our sponsors, right, we have some great giveaways this year. So this drone, I can see what it's doing with my goggles. Take those off. Inside the goggles, I can see the drone and only what the drone sees. So I need what's called a spotter to kind of tell me what's going on around the drone. So we're going to give away some of these goggles today from Fat Shark. What do you guys think about that? Now, in addition to that, we're also going to give away a drone right now. So it's going to go to the first person that can tell me the age the, just the age is all I want, so think for just a second. If you can anticipate my question, 
I'm looking for the age of the largest purse winner for drone racing today. Anybody know it? I don't hear it yet. I'm looking. 13, no, not 13. And it has to come from, this is for the kids. Let the kids answer. Okay. Okay, hang on. I, I, it's, it's tough. I heard 15 here, but I also heard every other number. 15 is the age of the, the largest purse. Do you guys know what a purse is, right? It's a lot of cash. The largest purse drone racing winner in history, $250,000 just a couple months ago at the Drone Grand Prix in Dubai. Everyone was flown over for free. That drone we were just flying, buddy, what's your name? Alex? Did you say Alex? Alex, you're walking away with a drone today, buddy. Okay. Hey, he hacked it, guys. I can't, I can't do anything about it. He just said 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Kept going. He knew it was a kid, right? 15 years old. Any 15-year-old people, in, in, any 15-year-olds in the room? I see two. Yeah, a few around here. Great. Guys, $250,000. How much do you think college costs? Who's going to Yale? You can go. 200, MIT. Come on, guys. Who's going to MIT? 250 grand. I see a lot of hands for MIT. That's fantastic. How about Georgia Tech? No? Okay, a couple of hands. Okay, all that, all things possible. Drone racing, right? But there's a lot of responsible things you need to think about with drones. We're going to talk about that. How to be a responsible pilot and then how to build this stuff too. So our motto is fight in flight versus fight or flight. Okay, so we're, we are actually creating drone games that will allow our drones to do battle. That's going to be something we're releasing here at DEF CON a year over year. It's going to get bigger. It's a no rules contest arena where the audience can hack the drones too. It's going to be a lot of fun. What do you guys think about that? All right. Today, one of the cool things that's happening downstairs, downstairs right now, they're building the capture the flag that we talked about last year. All the things we talked about last year have happened which is really awesome. We have a great community that's came, come together from DEF CON and we've become a formal 501c6 and we've been building this up just so DEF CON can release these games, okay? So Roots made all of that happen. So if you've been coming to Roots, all of you made that happen. So thank you so much. Let's give everyone in here a hand and we look forward to seeing you at Drone Wars today. Thank you. All right, well, that is it for these wonderful talks that we heard this morning. And that means workstations are about to open up. A reminder, we have soldering and badge coding over here, where, uh, 3D printing and wearables over here. The CTF is gonna start at one. There's gonna be four other workstations that start at one. The junkyard is probably gonna open up now or at one. Um, it's up to them. <laughs> Uh, but we'll also make sure that we're going to give a quick intro of all of the workstations that'll start at one. So probably at about 1250, they'll come up to the stage, give a quick explanation of what is going on for those workstations so that you can decide which workstation you'd like to participate in. And don't forget to eat some food. 